So good evening and welcome to the Marshall Lyon County Library and this wonderful program that is brought to us by you because of the Legacy Amendment which you voted on in November of 2008 and we're very grateful for all that funding that has made a difference in our community. Um, a couple of things coming up next Monday Tony Amato from SMSU will be talking about the Russian Revolution in relation to World War I. And then the following Friday and Saturday, Friday at 7, Saturday at 2, and then Halloween at 7, the Marshall Area Stage Company will pre be presenting Dracula, a radio drama, here in this room so you can see the live sound effects as well as hear the story. So we invite you to come for that. And if you are a writer or a dreaming of being a writer, we are promoting NaNoWriMo, National Novel Writing Month, but we are also doing No Novel, No Problem. So if you were writing something, maybe you just want to tell a story to your grandkids or you have a poem you want to work on, we'll help you do that. So we have several activities going on for that. And I also want to put in a promotion on November 9th, which is a Thursday night. We're having Professor Eric Carlson from Gustavus Adolphus College. He's going to talk about the Reformation and its cultural and social implications. So we hope you come for that. There is, of course, paperwork whenever you get a grant, and we do have some surveys, so before you go, it would be really helpful if you could just quick fill out this little bit of information for us before you go. So, without further ado, North Country Characters. On a little farm in Sweden, Miss Hilda Hansen one day sold all their pigs, horses, and rigs, packed up and sailed away. When in old New York she landed, they asked her, Are you alone? She answered, No, I got a bow. They asked, Let me telephone. Hello, Wisconsin. Have you seen my Yanni Johnson? Yes, tell him his Hilda Hansen. Yes, got off the boat by him anyhow. She wants him. You'll know Yanni Johnson, cause he's over six feet high. He'll yump for joy when he hears of come, cause my Yanni boy got to change my name from Hansen. To Janssen, so Wisconsin, goodbye. Well, when she landed in Wisconsin, her Yanni Janssen was there. Young, full of pride, made her his bride. Oh, what a happy pair. The years have showered them with blessings to little baby so high when shadows creep they go to sleep hearing this lullaby hello Wisconsin have you seen my Yanni Johnson just tell him he's a hill Hansen just got off the boat by him anyhow she wants him You'll know Yanni Janssen, cause he's over six feet high. He'll yump for joy when he hears of come, cause my Yanni boy won't to change my name from Hansen to Janssen, so Wisconsin. We want you to know that that music hall number was not written by Swedes. It was written by a couple of Jewish guys in Brooklyn <laughs> back going early, in the, early in the 20th century. But Ross loves to sing it, and it announces uh, the question that I have to ask you. We have to ask you to forgive us our Swedishness as we forgive those 
who hold our Swedishness against us. <laughs> we can't help it. All four grandparents spoke Swedish, and uh, we grew up listening to those languages, Swedish and Norwegian, even a little Danish on the streets of Roseau, Minnesota, and other places that we lived also. And we've pursued it some. But uh, we are really excited to be here at this new library that somehow I had missed. I was, gonna, I was trying to take Ross downtown from the hotel. And uh, Sarah, what, this is six years ago? Yeah, Siri saved us, I guess. So <clears throat> here we are in a library, a public library in southwestern Minnesota. And we've been trying hard to crack this Plum Creek library system. Let me tell Tough you. system to get into. <laughs> we have performed so in Pittsburgh. We have performed in Sweden. Do you think we could get into this Plum Creek system? Here we are. Finally. So, and the reason that we're, you know, we were so bent on getting in down here is that, uh, well, clearly I was an early graduate of SMSU and have some people I went to school with here now. And uh, we spent, what was it, about seven years, seven very formative years south of Jackson <clears throat> in the village of Petersburg. Is there anyone in the room who has been through Petersburg? Wow, wow, okay, population 50. That was actually a step up from us from Ross, Minnesota, where the population was 15. So we were feeling pretty cosmopolitan down there. And it was a fabulous place for kids to live. We had the best of times and we had the worst of times. The best of times meant running wild in pastures, up and down the Des Moines River, winter and summer, gravel pits. It's a wonder that we're here tonight talking to you. <laughs> that was freedom. But then our mother got sick with cancer and suffered for a couple of years and then died. So all of those happy memories are tinged too. Uh, we had good parents and they loomed large, so uh, we want to offer a tribute or two, or at least a poem or two, in which they figure. So um, I want to read My Mother at Swan Lake, which uh, is a real place where you, we used to picnic a lot, camp sometimes. It's right down on the Iowa border on the way to Esterville, if you've been there. A maniac for picnicking. She'd pack us up to go the very first thing in the spring. Sometimes we sat in snow, but we were well into the year. Swans had all long gone. We'd shed like leaves our nagging fears. The lake went pink and calm. Her hair had come back, her light low laugh, her cancer in remission, a state that gave us some relief from pain and vain religion. My dad had let me start the fire. I saw my mom was proud of how the flames kept growing higher. They wouldn't flicker out. I've clutched this day near 50 years, but I always felt so stupid that it could bring the sting of tears when there was nothing to it. My sister makes a small bouquet of weeds and faded asters, but I can't hear my mother say what she bends near to ask her. My brother's down beside the shore. I see his silhouette. My father calls out as before. Now don't go getting wet. My mother leans against a tree. She sighs. I hear her say across the half a century, it's been a lovely day. When the aches and pains of old times haunt you, when your cheeks are wet with tears of loneliness, when like heavy stones life's burdens taunt you, and the crying crane gives voice to your distress, let 
the winds of fall refresh your senses. Gaze with me about a pale blue sky. Come and stand with me by pasture fences. When the geese of autumn o'er the village fly, let the winds of fall refresh your senses. Gaze with me about a pale blue sky. Come and stand with me by pasture fences when the geese of autumn or the village fly. Ladies and gentlemen, Ross Sutter still hit the high notes in his six. Yeah, my wife says, why do you always have to go up there so high? Just keep it gentle. <laughs> that was uh, a song by a Swedish poet, Dan Anderson, who uh, wrote about, uh, especially a, about, a lot about the Finnish people that lived in Sweden and lived in America for a while, too. And a lot of his poems have been set to songs and there's groups of men who wear black floppy wool hats and sing every song he ever wrote in uh, men's choirs in Sweden. So, worth checking him out. I'm going to give you permission tonight to tell the story you want to tell about the miserable way he died. Well, I'm not sure if it's entirely true anymore. So, um, but the story I had heard, he was in Never New York. Never apologize. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. <clears throat> Well, he was in New York, or Stockholm, I'll just put him in all of them. <laughs> and he uh, was staying in kind of a dingy hotel, and every night they would put poison on the, the bedding and to kill all the bugs, the bed bugs. And apparently they didn't hang it out to dry or to air out well enough, and it was the poison that they put out that actually killed him. So. Or Dan, Boy, thanks for the yeah. song, Stan. <laughs> And uh, now a poem that my father figures in fairly prominently. This, I, I'm tempted to say this is about the gravel pit people because there were so, so many gravel pits down there south of Jackson <clears throat> and uh, were beloved places for most of us kids. Mm. I'll just do it and Ross will uh, follow this with a Swedish hymn. seeing as how he was a minister. My father and the Trondheims. When I was six, I fell in love with Jean Trondheim, who had a cloud of dark brown hair, a happy face, and so I asked her if she'd marry me, and she said yes, of course. We kissed out in the spruce grove during recess, so everybody knew that we were married, though <laughs> later, naturally, everyone forgot. Except, fast forward, in our 20s, in the city, Jean and I collided quite delightfully, and we were still in love a little. So we kissed and went to bed a time or two, but you know how it goes, it wasn't meant to be. Astrological, she said. Yet, every now and then, she'll surface once again. We always kiss, and even though we married other people, we both know who we married first. <laughs> forever is forever, after all. But memory, not marriage, is the subject of this story. The point is that her little brother drowned. The Trondheims owned a gravel pit outside the tiny town where we grew up, and that rambunctious family loved to splash and porpoise in the pit. Who wouldn't? They had scads of kids, the Trondheims, being Catholic in those days of meatless Fridays, autocratic priests, and guesswork birth control. The siblings scrapped and helped each other out, but somehow someone wasn't watching or forgot, because that day the little brother drank and drank pit water and went down. I can't recall the details or the little brother's name, 
except he drowned. And who knows why? But the priest couldn't come from town somehow. And so my father, a minister who worried he'd offend the Trondheims, decided still he'd better go and went. He took his Bible, this I know, but who knows what he said. He wasn't very eloquent, I'll bet, but he was kind, I'm sure. I'm sure he told them he was sorry, led them in a prayer, even as they gagged and gasped for air. Decades later, any time that Jean and I surprise each other on the street, I see she's glad to see me, sure. But still I know she's thinking of that little brother in the water. For unfailingly, she will remind me of this kindness that my father did the Trondheims long ago, as if she feared that somehow I'd forgot. My dad is dead, but not to them, he's not. Jag har en vän som älskar mig, så hurt att han lär offra sig på kurset upp på Golgata med hjärta från. It's basically the Swedish, what a friend we have in Jesus. And uh, it was sung often at funerals, and we had the most fantastic experience a couple years back. We were uh, doing a show in a nursing home, and Ross started in on that song, and here came the most heavenly harmony out of an old guy in a wheelchair out there. And I was misting up. Bill Holm told me, that's okay, okay, Scandinavians cry at music. That's it's a safe place for them to <laughs> express their emotions. <laughs> so I was misting up, and afterwards, of course, we went and talked to him. And he said, well, I grew up in a little town, uh, and my parents spoke Swedish, so I learned Swedish. And there were a lot of Swedes around, and as the old timers started to die, I could sing. They asked me to sing. I sang Yahar and Ben at 127 funerals. <laughs> he kept track. <laughs> yeah, it was great. So speaking of Bill, I have to uh, read uh, my poem about Bill Holm. Is there anyone in this room who, did not, who does not know who Bill Holm was until fairly recently? No one. Everyone knows Bill Holm of Minneota, Minnesota, the Icelander extraordinaire, and what a terrific host he was, especially for traveling musicians, writers, 
or anybody who was odd enough to be interesting. <laughs> this was about one of my stays there. Not sleeping at Bill Holmes' house. <laughs> Hi, Bill. In the corner of my narrow room, there's a double-barreled shotgun which will not go off in this poem. <laughs> Reclining on the bedclothes, a small stuffed bear and pink flamingo, which I set aside. <laughs> Turning back to spread, I am greeted by red flannel sheets bearing a Frosty the Snowman motif. <laughs> this bed is too loud to sleep on. <laughs> And I am too wired with coffee and wild ideas to dream but settle in anyhow with a volume of Sandberg, a poet far better than I had remembered, who talks <coughs> of the tombs and the grass and passengers rocketing into the dark toward strange destinations like Omaha. What could be stranger than Omaha? I'm a passenger myself in this crooked old house full of books and the ghosts of hot arguments. Where are we going? The clock says two, and out in the yard, a barred owl asks, who, who are you? I answer that I am a passenger on the Miniota Express, bound for points west, Canby, and Mars. I can hear in the next compartment my comrade, my host, the polar bear of American literature, cough and hack and growl in his sleep, which I envy. I can't count sheep or the number of books in this house. In the outer room, a harpsichord waits as patiently as a horse-drawn cab in a story of Sherlock Holmes. Who done it? Who knocked me out? And how did it get to be daylight? Bill banging out hymns on the downstairs piano. Just now, that sweet shaker tune, tis a gift to be simple. Tis, tis, tis also a gift to be complex and ornery, with a house full of music, cigar smoke, and whiskey, and Icelandic sagas preserved by farmers for nearly a thousand years. Tis a gift to be simple, tis a gift to be free, tis a gift to come down where we are to be. And when we find ourselves in the place just right, we'll be in the valley of love and delight. Sing it now. When true simplicity is gained, to bow and to bend we shall be ashamed to turn, turn will be our delight till by turning, turning we come round right. When true simplicity is gained, to bow and to bend we shan't be ashamed to turn, turn will be our delight till by turning, turning. So we're doing North Country characters. Uh, there are various definitions of North Country, right? So all of Minnesota counts, if you're looking at us from Alabama. I published a book called Cold Comfort, Life at the Top of the Map. But when I 
have taken that book to Canada, people are saying, what are you talking about? <laughs> what map are you talking about? But I, I thought we should get out of southwestern Minnesota here a little bit and uh, <clears throat> get someone from farther north. So, uh, you know, we're taking characters from our family, we're taking old neighbors and friends, and uh, in this case, uh, the character is someone I just heard about from some fellows I was fishing with. They kept talking about this fa fairly colorful fella, and I decided <clears throat> maybe I could make a poem of this. I ought to. It seemed like he deserved that small honor. This is called Little Caesar. Lefty Larson, an epileptic Vietnam vet, fell crazy in love with canoe country, went off down river and up the creek, with a paddle, fish pole, an overstuffed pack, and nobody knew if he'd ever come back. After the war, he found the country he was fighting for. The citizens were ravens, eagles, and loons, the air perfume of pine and spruce. In the holy hush of his own company, on a granite slab in the jack pine shade, Lefty made a kind of personal truce. Bought a small place up in Beaver Bay, where the locals dubbed him Little Caesar in honor of his frequent seizures. Paperwork betrayed him. He was on meds. The state took his driver's license away. But Lefty didn't give a rip. Neither did the sheriff or the state patrol. Everybody knew his rusted out truck, topped with a fleet of battered canoes. When Lefty felt his mouth go dry, He'd pull to the shoulder or drive in the ditch, stretch and kick till his fit was over. He'd lie there and twitch while the cars banged by. It wasn't like somebody was going to die. Good with kids, he taught them how to fish, enchanting them with nonstop chatter. He's sucking your leech, set the hook, tip up, tip up, you got it? No, son, you just let a trophy go. You could say Lefty had a case of the bends from the way he rode that river flow. He got to know all the walleye holes and stashed his gear at his favorite sites as if that river belonged to him. Built bonfires to drive back the night and watch the sparks climb out of sight. Some folks worried he'd come to harm, but Lefty went 27 days one time and only lost the skin off both his arms from too much bug dope, maximum deet. <laughs> the water was wide, the water was sweet. Lefty's friends all knew he'd drown. They'd seen him drop in his canoe, shudder and buck, shake and flail like a fresh caught fish in a metal pail. But Lefty had scored an airline jacket. If a fit comes on and I fall out, I yank this cord. The thing inflates. No sweat, man. I'm sure to float. Lefty was tough. He could hack it. And the little bugger never went down. But Lefty had problems. His brain seized up. He turned into a drooling babbler. He's living with his brother down south somewhere. But we still talk about him up around here. Lefty wasn't bland like me and you. Lefty had character. He was one, too. Lefty, come out wherever you are. The Milky Way is a river of stars.
That's the theme song of the Iron Range, Moya Dekla. And the one before that, I still don't know the name of it. Well, if we were doing uh, North Country characters, we felt we should have at least one creature as a character. So I put my dog in here. One of my dogs, a runner, part shepherd, part husky. That's northern enough, don't you think? That dog, I spent about half my time chasing that dog. To get out of the tightest collar. Would you believe that dog once ended up in Apple Valley from Duluth? <laughs> She didn't run all the way. She was out loose down by the Rose Garden and some strangers saw her. She was a dead ringer for the dog they had lost two months before and they thought, reincarnation. <laughs> and drove off with her to Apple Valley. And only a week later or so, their conscience bothered them enough that they started calling the Luth Pound to see, uh, do we know, have no. So we got her back, and of course, she ran again, and again. Lessons I learned from our dog Sophie, a husky shepherd cross my wife picked from the pound because Sophie was pretty, and the only quiet dog in the room who had been found half-starved wandering a golf course who ran away whenever she got the chance but still chose to live with us for 13 years. That's the title. <laughs> When I sent a draft of this poem to Phil Dacey, the late Phil Dacey, who was not late at the time, said, pretty good poem, title's too short. <laughs> <clears throat> the dog speaks. Be like me, the color of plowed earth and autumn grass. You'll blend in when you want, win compliments besides. Cock your head to the ground now and then. Wonder what's down there. Dig. Keep a wet nose and a whiff of the wolf about you. Never forget the great gift of four legs. Run. Run whenever you can. Pity the two-legged ones, though they loom above you and dream they're in charge. One of the joys of this life is scouting ahead and ranging around, but keep checking back on the less adventurous laggards and look on them with compassion before you dash off. Whenever you come to a fork in the path, wait for a sign from the talking heads, for they are less carefree. They have ideas. Crouch and sleek yourself before unfamiliar peers. Lay back your ears, narrow your eyes, lower your tail, and growl. When biting your friends, go easy, go easy. I believe that advice carries over to human beings. Too. <laughs> you should be on the lookout here for things you might take away from this evening. No, you can run the entire day away and still be barely rebuked as long as you're back by sundown. Prodding by snout often results in petting by hand. After you poop, kick up your heels. You might want to take that up, for example. <laughs> Never spend all of your piss in one place. <clears throat> Birds can be snatched out of bushes more often than squirrels can be caught on the run. The earth is worth listening to every once in a while. There's something down there. Dig. Keep digging. Welcome new snow, not with dread, but with bounding abandon. Rain is something else again. And hail, hail is hell. There is little to fear in this world except bridges, firecrackers, and thunder. All of these fears can be overcome except firecrackers and thunder. <laughs> a closet, a table, even a grand piano will serve as a den in a pinch. Yappings for puppies, barkings barbaric, howling, however, is you and clears the fog from your lungs. Howl for your missing master. Howl for your missing mistress. Howl for the children grown up and gone. Howl for the day they kept you corralled 
Howl for the loss of your ancestors, no more nights running the frozen rivers by moonlight. Howl for every indignity ever visited upon the race of dog. Howl for the mute frustration of snuffles and woofs, for the lack of language except for this heartfelt, gut-felt moan by means of which you make your ultimate loneliness known. Whining works wonders, but don't overdo it. Butt sniffing is fun. Never walk when you can run. Keep digging. Keep digging. I had a dog and his name was Blue. I had a dog and his name was Blue. I had a dog and his name was Blue. I bet you five dollars he's a good dog too. Singing here. position for a Midwestern male of being married to a woman who's far handier than I am. Better carpenter, better car mechanic, better painter, you name it. Maybe it's fortunate, I don't know. A little embarrassing sometimes. For my wife upon the garage roof. I'll say nothing of Donner or Blitzen, just the 60-some-year-old vixen whose rambunctious life I've now shared for several adventurous years, who has climbed upon the garage roof, whom I've handed up her triage stuff, her long-handled loppers and saw while holding the ladder in awe. She is going right after those branches while I'm telling her, Hunt, don't take chances of trees that are rubbing the shingles. I would rather be married than single, and I've said there are those who would do this, professional men who'd conclude this for less than outrageous pay, but she's never cared much what I say. She's a really formidable kisser, and if she were dead, I would miss her. But the neighbors know well there's no stopping a project on which she's got hopping. At the moment, she's hopped on the rooftop, and it's looking to me like a long drop, yet she's scooting on out to the edge, which has got to produce quite a wedgie, then leaning way out with her clippers to snap off offending tree tippers. The power lines fail to electrocute her, which is good, because this way she's cuter. Now she's backing her way down the ladder, with me feeling gladder and gladder and finding the moral at bottom. Rejoice in your wives while you've got it. 
Well, aside from this touring, uh, Ross and I have a social life because of our gray hair, because of our missing <coughs> hair, which is narrowing. Highlights for us now frequently consist of attending funerals, of which there seem to be more and more suddenly. It's all right. Lunches are sometimes quite good. <laughs> I was at one a couple of years ago and uh, sitting at the lunch across the table from me was an older couple and we were about five minutes into this when I suddenly realized these two are newly in love. Now, isn't that sweet? And I wondered where they had met. Wondered possibly it was at a different funeral earlier. <laughs> and then I was lost to thinking about these two for several days. He met her at a funeral. It might have been a dance had they been younger. They were not. Despite the circumstance, he couldn't help but notice her and thought he'd take a chance. At the post interment basement lunch, we'll I'm probably again. prouder of that line than almost any other line <laughs> I've said. But I guarantee, goddamn, to you, you will not find that in the history of American literature anywhere. <laughs> At the post interment basement lunch, he gave her his best plans. Her face was wrinkled, sure enough, but also soft and smooth. She had a low and gentle voice like mothers use to soothe. He told a story on their friend. She laughed and he rejoiced. This woman might be past her prime, but definitely choice. Turned out she was Norwegian. Just like his, her eyes were blue. And what a wild coincidence. She liked coffee, too. <laughs> he felt his Elsa wouldn't mind. Her passing had been long ago. 
Now this pretty woman was affecting him like song. She had nice manners, liked to laugh, but kept it dignified and decent as a person should, their good friend having died. They walked out to the parking lot. He asked if he might call someday to take her out for pie. She wasn't shy at all. So that was the beginning there. He'd found his second wife. He met her at a funeral that brought him back to life. <laughs> Since Bart's been reading that poem, we've had two or three couples come up to us and admit they met at funerals. <laughs> it happened just it happened like that. Just like that. <laughs> Here's one more. Sugar in the morning, sugar in the evening, sugar at supper time. Be my little sugar and love me all the time. Honey in the morning, honey in the evening, honey at supper time. Be my little honey and love me all the time. Put your arms around me and swear by the stars above. Sugar in the morning, sugar in the evening, sugar at supper time. Be my little sugar and love me all the time. Oh, sugar time is any time that you're near or oh, just a peep, so say you'll be my honeycomb. We'll live in. Be my little sugar and love me all the time. Honey in the morning, honey in the evening, honey at supper time. Be my little honey and love me all the time. Oh, put your arms around me and swear by the stars above. You'll be mine forever in heaven of love. Last chance, sugar in the morning, sugar in the evening, sugar at supper time. Sugar and love me all the time. Oh yes, be my little sugar and love me all the time. There's one more aspect of our social life, I guess, and that's fishing. We sometimes go fishing. We like our own company, the two of us. And uh, it was uh, a few years back now that we were fishing up north of Finland. Finland, Minnesota, not uh, <laughs> across the ocean there. That's off the North Shore and up, and we were back there in the woods. We did very well. We had a limit of walleyes by noon, and we're driving the gravel roads out, and we came across this tavern. We had no idea it was there. Stop the car. Let's go see what they got. The sandwiches in the sack can wait for the ride home. And it was fabulous. Dark wood, juicy burgers, crispy fries, the sort of waitress we like best, late middle age, sassy, call you fellas. That's a word that doesn't get used enough anymore. Don't you agree, Jerry? What would you fellas like? You know, what are you fellas? <laughs> all it needed, all that they needed for perfection was some country western tunes on the jukebox. So I took a pocket full of quarters back there, and there were no country western tunes. They were all of them, every last one of them, country northern. And I've never heard of one of them. <laughs> I thought, this is something. I went and got a napkin, copied them all down, and I just presented them as my own poem. Here they are. <laughs> Titles. Jukebox tunes from the Dirty Shame Saloon. Her perfume smelled like bug dope, and he can't forget. Evergreen blues. Oh, for nice. Meet me in the fish house and we'll somehow find the room. <laughs> Voices sure sound louder over water. The 
Pete Bog King of Kuchiching. You might wear moose-eyed mucklucks, but you've got an ugly truck. <laughs> Blueberry boogie, the oil can rag, oof to mega mama, there's a teardrop in my eye. Where have all the crew cuts gone? Good question. You must be a mosquito, babe, because you sure love to whine. The trout creole reel, fooey on you. Somewhere north of nowhere, everything went south. That's a really sad one. <laughs> Shotgun shottish. Lake Superior's wide and blue, and so, my love, are you. The trouble with linoleum. Oh, sing a little bit of that part. That's my favorite. Goes, uh, I think it went, the trouble with linoleum. It's always rolled so tight that when you go to lay it out, you're up for half the night. That's the way it started. <laughs> it's a big hit up there. <laughs> When I think back on Ludafisk and left so warm and dry, my man's an iron miner, but he's not made of steel. Snowshoe shuffle with a boy toy. <laughs> the cedar swamp stomp. And our favorite, when the smelt buckets are loaded, I'm coming home to you. <laughs> so, would you like to hear that one? Our favorite, we'll sing that one. Yeah, we'll finish off with this. So we want to go out rousing here. Here's the chorus. It goes like this. When the smelt buckets are loaded, I'm coming home to you. That's all there's to it. <laughs> Thanks a lot for hosting us here. It's been great to be here again. We do have some books and CDs for sale over there. Any other announcements? We'll be in Wyndham tomorrow at 2, so call all your friends and tell them we'll be there. Or uh, warn them, they're coming. Warning, yeah. Leave them. Uh, Tyler at 9.30, no, not Tyler. Tracy, Tracy. 9.30 a.m. on Thursday. I don't have any idea who's going to be there at 9.30. And uh, 6.30 in Westbrook. And I don't, I'm not even sure where that is yet. We're going to find it, though, on Thursday. So it's been a wonderful tour uh, down here in we weren't disappointed by Plum Creek libraries. <laughs> the only thing that's gnawing at us a little bit is we didn't even do half the libraries in the system. So, yeah. it's another next tour time. there. Yeah, next time. <clears throat> Are you ready? I think so. Well, the fish ain't like the old days. It's only just a few. But I sure like this dip net you bought for me brand new. And I'm still dipping in the dark, my hands are turning blue. When the sun buckets are loaded, I'm coming home to you. You're a woman who'll eat minnows, you'll never shout. Pew! You'll, you'll chop, chop their little heads off and gut them through and through. Then batter fry the lot of them, and they'll be crunchy too. When the smell buckets are loaded, I'm coming home to you. There'll be ketchup on the table, steak sauce and barbecue. A bowl of homemade coleslaw, just be me and you. We'll eat our fill of fish and then I'll toast you with a brew. When the smell buckets are loaded, I'm coming home to you. Now the smelt buckets are loaded, and I'm half loaded too. I'm driving home to Fridley, I've got a can of chew. When I get in, I'll wake you up, you'll know just what to do. Now the smelt buckets are loaded, I'm coming home to you. Now the smelt buckets are loaded, I'm coming